All right, thank you everybody for for joining today's virtual seminar. Uh, my name is Leo Rivera. I'm uh, the hydrology product manager here at Decagon Devices. Um, I'm also the person that, that works with the HyProp and uh, um, have quite a bit of experience with the HyProp and, and running the HyProp. So today I'm gonna go over some uh, refilling techniques and, and, and also answer any questions that you guys might have. So uh, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to use the um, questions function on the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. And I will try and get to them throughout the virtual seminar. So please feel free to ask questions anytime and I will do my best to, to get to them when I can and, and try and keep an eye out for them. Um, so we'll go ahead and just get going. Oh, one sec. There we go. All right. So in today's virtual seminar, first I'm going to cover, uh, we're going to go through refilling techniques and the, I'm going to start out covering the syringe filling of tensiometers. And then I'm going to talk about uh, vacuum system options for refilling. Um, some things to consider when you're assembling the high prop after you've finished filling. And then also we're going to preview the new high prop view software. Um, and so we'll get, get into that too. All right. So the syringe filling option is the, uh, is what comes base basic or what comes with the high prop um, and what's, what's what a lot of people have started out with. Um, it is a little more complicated. It takes a little more attention to detail and, and uh, uh, a little more time as well. Um, but really the key to a, a good fill in using the syringes, especially if you're trying to achieve uh, the maximum level of the tensiometers, which is well beyond 850 hectopascals, uh, it's, the key is achieving full vacuum. Um, and one of the things that prevents us from getting full vacuum with the syringes is when we have air bubbles in the syringe, similar to what you see in this picture here. Um, those air bubbles uh, prevent us from being able to, to, uh, to uh, achieve the full vacuum level when we're applying vacuum with the syringes. And so what you have to do when you're applying vacuum with the syringes or when you're filling with the syringes is you have to make sure that you go through the process of, of applying vacuum and releasing the vacuum and making sure there's no air bubbles when you release the vacuum. Um, and if there is removing the air bubbles. Um, so you have to have to make sure that that you go through that process. It takes usually a few times of, of, of applying the vacuum, uh, reconnecting it, and then removing the air bubbles. Uh, so you really wanna make sure that you take your time to do that. And, and when you do that, uh, it gives you the ability to go beyond um, the normal uh, measuring range of a tensiometer. Um, another thing that helps with the uh, when you're filling the tensiometer shafts is positioning them upright to allow the bubbles to escape more easily. Um, so here I, what you see in this picture here, I have a, a clip set up in the lab that allows me to, to hold the tensiometers upright. So essentially with the ceramic pointing down, um, and this, this allows the air bubbles to escape, uh, easily, um, and uh, usually what I'll do is I'll set these up and I will leave them overnight um, to uh, allow the degassing process to happen and, and get the water as well degassed as possible. Now, some other things to consider when you start when you're starting to fill with the syringes is uh, it does help to degas the water previously, whether you're using a vacuum system to do it or uh, you can degas water by boiling it. Um, when you do that, though, of course, you want to let it cool down. <laughs> um, but yeah, you want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, when, when you do start out, if you degas the water previously, it does help. Um, it doesn't take care of all of it because even you'll notice after degassing that it, when you start, uh, when, when you start, uh, uh, 
the gassing on the tensiometer shafts themselves, uh, they do, um, oh, sorry, uh, that there will be air bubbles forming. Uh, okay. um, did have a question um, about the audio. There, there is, uh, as far as we can tell, the audio should be working. Um, if you can check to make sure you have the audio output to the right speakers on your on your system, uh, that would be helpful. Um, but as far as we can tell, everything's working. Okay. Um, so let's keep going. Oh, there we go. So, in my opinion, when you're filling e either with with the tent with the um, with the syringes or with the vacuum system, the most important step to pay attention to is filling the sensor base itself. Um, for many reasons, one, this is probably the most sensitive part of the instrument. So, when you're filling, uh, you want to make sure you don't. Uh, re suddenly release the vacuum. Uh, you don't want to tap the instrument base too hard um, because uh, because you can damage the pressure transducers very easily. So you really want to be careful with this. Um, but also, this is another, it's important here because if you don't degas the sensor base well, no matter how well you degas the tensiometer shafts, you're not going to get a good fill with the, uh, um, you're not going to get a good fill with the tensiometers and you're not going to reach the maximum achievable range of the tensiometers. Um, so again, here, achieving full vacuum is, is really critical when you're uh, trying to degas the sensor base. And what you see here in this image is just started degassing and you can see a lot of uh, air bubbles starting to come out and, 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 uh, and oxygen starting to be released from the water. So when I talk about achieving the full vacuum, um, the best thing to do is connect the high prop to the computer and, and watch it in the refilling window in Tensio view, uh, to see how full a vacuum you're actually applying. And typically what you have to do again here is, uh, you have to go through that process I talked about of applying the vacuum and then carefully releasing the vacuum uh, to um, uh, to then take the syringe off and remove any air bubbles uh, that might be in the syringe when there's no vacuum and then going through this process again. And it, again, this is one of those things that may, may take two or three times of, of applying and releasing the vacuum, sometimes a few more, depending on how much water you have in your uh, in your sensor, in the acrylic reservoir, and in your syringe. Um, usually it's good to, I fill the syringe up with about 10 mils of water, and then you'd want to fill your acrylic adapter up as full as possible because uh, the less, um, the less air space you have in there, the more likely you're going to be able to achieve full vacuum. So here, after I've removed air from the syringe and reapplied the vacuum a few times, now I can see that I'm reaching 879 hectopascals in the software. And uh, that, that is, for, for us, that's close to full vacuum up here at, at our elevation. And so we're really happy with that. And that's, that's what's going to allow us to get a really good degassing of the water and get a good, um, uh, excuse me, uh, good filling on the tensiometers and allow us to extend that range. Um, and again, just like with the tensiometer shafts, uh, it's good to leave the sensor base under vacuum for several hours. Uh, I typically recommend starting this in the afternoon and then just leaving it overnight and coming back in the morning and, and you'll have everything ready to go and start uh, uh, assembling the high prop. Um, so it does take time for this to to degas well, and so it's just good to be patient with it and let it and let it do its thing. So another option for refilling the high props, so refilling the tensiometers and the the sensor base, is using a vacuum system uh, to to refill the to to do your refilling. Um, this option is 
easier than syringe filling uh, by far. It's, it's quite a bit easier. Um, and it's really when you, if, if you're working in a lab and you're running more than one high prop, if you're running two or three or four high props or even more, uh, a vacuum system really simplifies the filling process for, uh, for degassing and filling the high props. Um, and, the, and the nice thing about this is it's, it's a much faster setup. Um, essentially, you just you would typically just connect the tensiometers to whatever setup you have. In this image here, I have the uh, uh, system from UMS that allows us to just connect the, t the tensiometer shafts to an acrylic adapter, and then uh, and then connect everything to a vacuum system, and and put the tensiometers in a beaker full of. Uh, degassed DI water and, uh, and put that under vacuum. Um, and it's, it's, it's really a much simpler setup. Um, some precautions that you want to take when using a vacuum system for refilling. Uh, you want to make sure you don't get too powerful of a vacuum. Um, because again, with the, t with the pressure transducers on the high prop, you want to be careful not to damage them because they are sensitive. Um, so, uh, I have seen some cases where somebody had, some people had really just strong vacuum systems and they would very easily damage the uh, pressure sensors. And so that's something you want to be careful with. So um, when you're looking at your specs, you, you want to make sure it's a, uh, not as strong of a vacuum system because uh, if you give it time, it'll pull full vacuum. Um, for example, the system that we have, it usually takes about 30 to 45 seconds, maybe a minute to achieve full vacuum. Um, if it's something that can achieve full vacuum in a faster time than that, then you'll want to be careful. Uh, so um, there are some off-the-shelf options, uh, or there is an off-the-shelf option from UMS for a vacuum re refilling system. Um, so they have a full package that includes a vacuum pump, um, a buffer bottle, and the beaker mount assembly that you saw in the previous uh, image. And um, this is a really good system, it's, uh, easy to use. Um, and uh, if you're just looking for something that's straightforward and, and, and you don't wanna have to go through the hassle of tr trying to put your own vacuum system together, this is a good option. Um, now, now you can set up your own vacuum system um, and, uh, there's some things that you want to consider when going to do that. So again, we talked about the strength of the vacuum pump. Uh, you want to be careful not to select a vacuum pump that's going to damage the pressure sensors. Um, and so, so you want to be careful for that, uh, depending on the type of pump that you pick. If, for example, in the image here, this is an oil type pump, uh, you're going to want to use desiccant in line to keep moisture out of the oil. Um, if you don't do that, you'll notice that the oil turns, goes from clear to white very quickly or opaque. Um, and uh, it uh, will have to, you'd have to change the oil very regularly on those pumps. If you use desiccant in the line, it'll, it'll protect the pump. It'll last much longer. Um, and so that's something you'll have to consider when looking at different vacuum pumps. Some people have vacuum in the labs, in, in, their, in their lab, uh, that's, that's just plumbed in. Um, again, you'll want to be careful with that vacuum just to make sure that you're not uh, applying the vacuum too fast to prevent yourself from damaging the uh, pressure sensors. So another thing that helps to uh, protect the pressure transducers, and, and this is something that you need to really need to have in the system is a buffer bottle. Um, I recommend at least a one liter buffer bottle, if not larger, uh, especially depending on your vacuum pump and, and how strong it is. Um, this, this one, the buffer bottle not only helps for maintaining the vacuum, but it, it helps to pretend, protect the, uh, uh, pressure transducers. Um, it's also good to have a vacuum gauge, um, in your system, just so you can see what's going, what level of vacuum you're at and when you need to come back and put it under vacuum again, um, those types of things. Uh, then the other things that you'll have to look for are connections for the tensiometer shafts and the high prop. So uh, the 
The fitting on that acrylic adapter for the high prop has a six millimeter inside diameter. So typically tubing you're gonna wanna go with is, is tubing with the six millimeter inside diameter. Um, uh, polyethylene tubing is good. Um, it's usually, uh, poly I think polyurethane is usually fine as well. Uh, you just wanna pick tubing that uh, is gonna be rigid and hold up to vacuum. Um, you don't want a tubing that's going to collapse under vacuum because then you won't get vacuum throughout the full system. Um, in this picture in the bottom right hand corner here, I have little push to connect fittings. And then we have some little silicon tubing that we use to connect the uh, tensiometer shafts to that. Um, so if you're going about setting up your own system, these are really good fittings for that. Um, there's various places here in the U.S. There's various places you can buy them. Uh, McMaster Cars, a place that I go to quite regularly to buy these types of fittings. Um, the silicon tubing that we used here, I believe, has a four millimeter inside diameter and a seven millimeter outside diameter, and uh, and that that fits tight enough around the, the tensiometer shafts to to not leak and maintain the vacuum. Um, so, so those are some some of the things that you're going to want to consider. Of course, you're going to need some uh, beakers and and degas to add water to uh, the beakers to put the tensiometers in for the when you're when you're filling them. Um, some other things to consider. Uh, I, th I think that's about the bulk of that. Um, you can also, uh, if you wanted to buy your own vacuum pump. Uh, the beaker mount assembly from UMS is also uh, an option. So if you could just wanted to get your own vacuum pump and buy that assembly, that's also an option. Um, it just depends. Uh, vacuum pumps are, the vacuum pump is probably the most expensive part of the system from UMS. Um, so uh, yeah, again, those are just some of the options that are out there. Um, so now I wanted to go into kind of some things that you want to be uh, consider when you're assembling the high prop, uh, getting ready to start a measurement. Um, and so uh, of course, when you start out, you want to carefully release the vacuum on the systems. Uh, that way you don't damage the pressure transducers again. Um, and once you have the vacuum released and you have all the tubing disconnected and you're ready to start going, uh, you want to remove the acrylic adapter. Um, when you remove the acrylic adapter, leave the water on the high prop base because that water just helps when you're trying to go through and connect the tensiometers and and do the filling or do the assembly sorry um when once you have that ready to go you'll prep the tensiometers um this is all stuff that you've probably seen in the manual but i'm just kind of going through it anyways uh when you prep the tensiometers whether you're disconnecting them from the syringes or from that threaded adapter in the in the vacuum system uh you want to make sure you leave a, a nice bulb of water kind of like what you see in the picture here um this just helps prevent you from uh from uh getting an air bubble inside of the tensiometer shafts when you go to connect to the sensor unit um if for some reason you lose that air bubble um it, you can use the uh, needle tip syringe that is comes with the high prop vacuum, or, but with the high prop uh, refilling kit. Um, when you do that, you want to degas the water inside of that syringe first, just to help, because uh, you don't want to be adding uh, non-degassed water to something that you've already degassed. Um, and then you can go in and once it's degassed, you can use this needle and and go in and uh, add water to the uh, end of the tensiometer shaft to uh, re-add that bulb of water if for some reason you lost it. Um, when you do this, of course, make sure you have no air in the syringe itself uh, or in the in the needle tip of the syringe because you don't want to add air bubbles to the system. Um, but uh, this is an easy thing to do to, to redo that. Um, when you're connecting the tensiometers to the sensor head, it's always good to come in at an angle. Um, and then once you are in contact with the water, try not to pull the sensor back again. Um, if you do, you're probably gonna have to re-add that bulb of water. Um, but uh, yeah, so you'll wanna come in at an angle. Uh, once you do, just 
once you connect it in, you can just start th start threading it in. Um, usually, you don't have an issue with the pressure until you come in contact with the bot the O ring inside the sensor head. Um, but once you do come in come in contact with the O ring, you're going to want to be careful uh, to not exceed 2,000 hectopascals. Um, so of course, while you're doing this connection, you should be monitoring the pressure inside of the refilling window on the software. Um, now, once you come in contact with the uh, uh, with the O-ring, it's good to do at least a quarter to a half turn after you've come in contact with the O-ring. You want to make sure that you get that fairly tight on there. Um, uh, as long as you do it slowly, and don't exceed the pressure, uh, you're not going to damage the, uh, uh, the, the sensors. Um, and just ensuring that you have that tied in there helps make sure that you're going to actually be able to achieve that full range of the tensiometers. Because uh, sometimes what happens if you don't get that thread down tight enough when you're making a measurement is the suction or the water potential uh, lowers or as the suction goes up. Um, Sometimes it can pull in air from where that connection is, and uh, and it and it makes the measurements look really bad. And I'm going to show an example of that here shortly. But again, just make sure when you're doing this that you just that you get it decently tight. Um, as long as you're not really trying to make it too tight, you're going to be fine. So uh, those are just some of the things that you want to make sure that you're doing. So uh, again. This was a, a good example of a good fill. Uh, we're able to achieve the full, uh, achieve well beyond normal measurement range up to 1,800 hectopascals. Those are the types of things that we want to be looking for. Uh, so uh, now our next example is of an OK fill. Um, we didn't really achieve the full capabilities of these tensiometers. Um, we went. Uh, uh, just shy of 900 hectopascals in the top tensiometer before before cavitation. So when you see, let's see if I can show the mouse here. So when you see this sloping like this, where it's starting to slope off like that, that means we're already starting to cavitate. And so, um, so pretty much once we get past this about this point right here, uh, you're going to want to stop your measurement right there just because uh, this data beyond that is not representative of what the actual water potential is. Um, so the, those are some types of things that you want to look for. This is okay. I mean, this is a normal operating range of a tensiometer, but with these tensiometers in the high prop, you can go well beyond that if with good, uh, good degassing and a good fill. So uh, that's something to... Uh, to look for and to achieve to go beyond this because it is very possible and 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 uh, with good good filling practices you can do this. Now, I wanted to show something of of something we typically don't want to see. Um, so in in this uh, this is I call this a bad fill, but really it's not indicative of the of the filling of the tensiometers. Uh, although in the top tensiometer you'll see that it did not go. Uh, it, it again cavitated before reaching 900 hectopascals. But with the bottom tensiometer, what you see is right as it reached about 180 hectopascals, uh, it started uh, dropping and you get this kind of noisy bouncing back up and down as it kind of just slowly decreases. What this indicates is that there's two things that could have gone wrong here. Uh, one, either the uh, the O-ring inside the tensiometer is bad, uh, has, has a, either a tear in it or something along those lines, or two, uh, you didn't tighten the tensiometers down tight enough. Um, and the reason you see this is essentially, the reason you see this bouncing up and down is, uh, is you're getting, you're applying suction and then once you reach a certain point, air comes in and you apply suction and then air comes in and the pressure drops back down. So, um, when you see this, you'll want to check both. You can check the O-ring, um, uh, but uh, before pulling the O-ring out, uh, you may want to try just refilling again and testing the tensiometers uh, after your fill. And you can just do this by, uh, once you have the tensiometers connected, 
um, to the high prop, just use a paper towel, dry the ceramic end of the paper towel and see if they uh, uh, reach uh, 800 hectopascals in a short amount of time, usually within 30 seconds. Once you come close to that, you can reapply water and you can assume that you're in good, in good shape. Um, if it does start having this issue, if it doesn't go beyond two or 300 hectopascals, uh, then you might want to look at replacing the O-ring. So, all right, now, um, I've kind of covered, uh, some of the filling stuff. Now I wanted to preview the new high prop view software. Um, and this is something that I'm really looking forward to coming out. Um, and I know that the guys at UMS are, are have been working hard on this and 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 are trying to get this out. And um, so so here's uh, the home screen or the the main view of the HyProp View software. You can see it looks a little different than uh, Tensio View. Um, the software is purely dedicated to running the high props. Um, but kind of wanted to point out some new things. Uh, one of the good things about the this new software is it is it supports the new high prop scale in a way that it's meant to be supported. So for those of you that have the new high prop scale, you'll notice that there's a connection in the back of it that and a mag, and then a, a, a magnetic adapter that allows you to connect the high prop directly through the scale. And currently, this connection uh, isn't uh, supported in Tensio View. But it will be supported in 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 the high prop view software, which uh, I'm really excited about because it just reduces the amount of cables that you have to have connected to a computer, um, and I, I think it just helps simplify things. And so you can see here in this example, we have two high props connected uh, via the high prop balance, and so it's connected through their individual connectors. Um, another thing that it does, it's it also supports. It'll still support connecting with the older system with the old current scales and the and the Tensio Link at UMS or the USB adapter, um, and uh, and what's nice is it supports both, so you can connect multiple high props and multiple high prop balances or the old current scales all to one one window, and 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 run them all through one window, and so it just it really helps for a lot of those people that have multiple high props. Um, uh, let's see. So I think another thing you all also notice in this example, we have the high props connected, but they don't have a scale yet connected associated with it. And it, and it gives you an error message showing that. And that's what these little, uh, flag indicators are right here that uh, you don't have a, a high pro a scale connected. You need to select a scale to associate it with these high props. Um, and you can have multiple scales connected and multiple high props connected all through the software, um, and as long as there's enough connections on the computer, of course. Um, but uh, but that's a really nice, another nice feature that's uh, included in the software. Um, let's see. Uh, another nice addition that they've included is, oh, excuse me. The software also now has additional units so we also have, uh, it now supports units of centimeters, uh, kilopascals, and hectopascals. And this will also be eventually integrated over into HyProp Fit as well, uh, where HyProp Fit will also support different units. Um, so that's something I, I really like, um, especially just because, you know, there are people that work in different units. Some people prefer centimeters, some people prefer hectopascals, some people prefer kilopascals. So hopefully we can... Uh, it'll help uh, kind of uh, help with just with some of those people. Um, let's see. So another nice feature that they're adding. Um, some people may have noticed that eventually, sometimes your high props tend to drift from zero a little bit, whether it is due to sediment buildup on the pressure transducers, which can happen if the high props aren't cleaned thoroughly before removing the tensiometer shafts. Um, and sometimes what that, that sediment buildup will do will actually cause an offset in the zero point for the uh, pressure sensors. Um, 
And so what they have now is an offset uh, recalibration. So uh, what you can do is place your high prop on its side and go into this offset recalibration window and and just reset the zero points on the pressure transducers. Uh, so that's going to be really nice for the users um, and uh, and and just really it'll be nice down the road when high props start to age a little bit. Uh, one last uh, view of the high prop view software. Um, this is what it would look like in the uh, measurement windows. And so what you can see here is there's actually multiple high prop measurement windows right here. And you can see the measurement from this high prop. Um, oh, another another thing that I didn't point out earlier is uh, what's really nice is you can start a measurement with multiple high props all running at the same time, and if one high prop finishes early, you can just stop the measurement for that high prop, and then disconnect it, go and get it refilled, um, and if it's ready to go before the other measurements are not completed, you can actually connect it back to the software and start the measurement again on that high prop while other measurements are going, um, uh, which is really nice because different soil types finish at different rates due to uh, just due to their, their conductivity and how, and how, how much water they hold. So uh, uh, that's going to be a really nice feature. Um, there's not much else to point out here. I mean, the measurement windows look fairly similar to what you've seen in Tensio view. It's maybe just a little cleaned up. Um, but, uh, this is kind of what the new software is going to look like. Um, the, the plan is to have a pre-release ver version of the software, uh, after it goes through some testing, um, ready to be out, ready, ready by the end of October. And, uh, and so we'll have, we'll have that, that available then. And then, uh, after it goes through a little more testing, they'll have a, a, a full really released version in by the end of November, uh, along with a new user manual to go along with that. So, um, so that's pretty much uh, pretty much all we have on that. Um, I don't know if there are any more questions out there about high prop filling or 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 anything along those lines. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can send them in the. Uh, uh, the go to webinar uh, question bar. Um, so we'll just uh, wait a second, see if any new questions come in. Um, all right. So uh, one of the questions that just came in is uh, what is the air entry value of the ceramic tips? That's a, a really good question, and that's actually something I didn't point out is that you can use the air entry point of the of the ceramic tips to get a additional measurement. Um, so I'll actually go back to that really quick. Uh, if you look in this, oh, too far. So if you look in this measurement here, you can see air entry for both the bottom and top tensiometers uh, when they when they use when they all, when they drop down to zero kPa, that's when you've reached the error entry point. Uh, when they come from UMS, the error entry is 880 hecto, or sorry, no, 8,800 hectopascals, so 880 kilopascals. Um, and uh, so that's that's how they come. Now, one thing to think of, consider uh, that does as as the tensiometers are used, as the ceramic is used, sometimes the air entry can slightly change. Uh, there is a way to test the air entry. Um, I believe it's in the manual, uh, but essentially you apply you apply pressure to the um, to the uh, threaded end of the tensiometer with it in water, and you slowly increase the pressure. And when you see air bubbles starting to come out from the ceramic whatever pressure that is, that's your air entry for that, uh, uh, for the ceramic. Um, so that's something to, uh, uh, to, to test as they're getting used. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So the air entry is, is 880, uh, kilo, 
kilopascals or 8,800 hectopascals. Uh, so I have a question here about uh, the time it takes to refill using the vacuum system. Um, and so the, this, again, go, I uh, would go back to just uh, when using the vacuum system, it takes only a few minutes to get things set up. But I personally like to leave it overnight under vacuum. So um, again, I'll start these in the afternoon and then come back in the morning and have everything ready to go and start assembling the high prop. Um, so it is, it is good to leave it overnight. You don't have to do it for that long. Um, you may not achieve the full vacuum level um, or the full measurement range of the tensiometer shafts, but uh, at least doing it for a couple hours is, is what I would recommend. Um, but, uh, but you can, if you leave it overnight, in my opinion, that just helps increase your measurement range of the tensiometers. So what you should see here is, uh, so another, showing an example of our measurement. So early on in the measurement, what you'll notice is that there's not really much of a difference between the bottom and top tensiometers. When it's like that, we can't really make a hydraulic conductivity measurement. Um, so, uh, so we can't really start making it until we start to get at least a little bit of a deviation between the two. You kind of start getting one on Friday. You'll notice right here. Um, I'll use the pen right here. So you kind of start getting a deviation right here. Um, and that then we can start using that to, uh, to make a, um, a hydraulic conductivity measurement. Now, uh, the software is is pretty conservative in 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 the in the level of data that it uses for, uh, and this is a high prop fit software I'm talking about. But it's pretty conservative in the level of of, of deviation it expects to measure to make a hydraulic conductivity measurement. Now, you can go through and adjust that, and and uh, and that's that's something that I only recommend for people who really understand the measurement that they're making, um, but. Uh, so really, I think maybe just to go back and answer this question, uh, it, on the wet end, it varies depending on soil type, um, depending on when you start getting that deviation. But on the dry end, it goes all the way until the tensiometers cavitate. So, um, so we can actually get a measurement of hydraulic conductivity all the way even at the air entry point of the ceramic. So that for different soils ranges, for the average water potential ranges between uh, 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 about 300 to 700 hectopascals, depending on the soil type. Or sorry, kilopascals, not hectopascals. Between 300 and 700 kilopascals. So, uh, I guess one last question that we have um this new software that's coming out is going to be free uh so people that already have the high prop will be able to just download the software um the this person is also asking about the price of the high prop um it depends on where you're buying uh, where you're at and where you're purchasing from um i would just contact your local distributor um of course here here in the u.s decagon devices is the distributor for ums um but in uh uh, they have distributors all over the world. So um, I would just get in contact with them and, and, uh, and ask them about that. Uh, so anyways, oh. Oh, okay, it looks like somebody wants me to repeat the answer to a question. I think it had to do with the, when we lost audio about the amount of time for refilling with the vacuum. I'll just again say that it, uh, it, I recommend typically starting in the afternoon and leaving it under vacuum overnight, but at least leaving it under vacuum for a couple hours is ideal. Um, but if you really want to 
get the water degassed well and, and push the measurement range of the high prop, leaving it degassing overnight is the best option. Um, so at minimum two hours, but uh, uh, ideally uh, overnight is the best is the best option. So, uh, looks like we're all through the questions, unless there's any other questions that, that need to come in. Oh, sorry. Actually, I missed this question. I miss Here we go. This question. So, using the syringe method, is it necessary to reassemble the syringe, the system, systems a few times, leaving the vacuum for several hour, hours during each time. Uh, my concern is the air that s the air that slowing comes out of the ceramic tips as the air comes out, vacuum is lost. Uh, just, oh, okay, yes, that's a good question. Um, yeah, if you're using the syringes and you're putting it under vacuum, no sound. There's, Oh. Uh, it sounds like we're still having audio problems. Yeah. Oh gosh. Uh, I, uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, we'll answer this last question and 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 call it a day. Um, when you're using the syringes for refilling. Uh, it is good to go through and uh, reapply the vacuum periodically, uh, especially if you're leaving them uh, over t over time. With the syringe syringes, you don't have the full of a big buffer volume like you do on the vacuum system, so they will lose vacuum over time. So, uh, hopefully, that takes care of everybody. Um, if you do have any other questions, uh, feel free to get back with us. Uh, contact us anytime. You can email myself. You can email us at support at decagon.com or you can contact the folks at UMS. Um, uh, we will have hopefully an archived version of this virtual seminar uh, available later. Uh, we'll, we'll try and include that in the follow up email um, to the for this. Um, we'll also include uh, a link for that, um, and, and I'll, we'll include some contact information. Um, but uh, I will also include a sign up for uh, people that want to be notified when the new software is available and when there's a download available. So we'll include that in the follow up email. So just keep an eye out for that. Um, Thanks for attending, and, and we apologize for some of the, the technical glitches that we've had. Um, and hopefully, we'll get those uh, squared away in the future. Um, thanks again, and have a good Thursday.